Welcome back. Strap in for another excursion into church history. Last week, we heard how in the early days, the church had to face some really daunting challenges. I mean, their home city of Jerusalem was destroyed. Their leaders, the apostles, they were all killed off or eventually died. And church communities across the world were facing really heavy persecution for pretty much the first 300 years of their existence. And yet, in spite of all that, the church managed to overcome all of these challenges and not simply survive, but even thrive and continued to grow. So the churches were springing up in cities all over the world. And you'll remember that through the apostles, God gave the churches four important things that really helped them maintain a sense of identity and unity to endure all of that persecution. First of all, the scriptures. Second of all, the creeds. Third, their pastors, which are otherwise known as bishops or elders. And fourth, their shared worship life, which was built around the word of God and the sacraments. Now today, I want to look at an event that really changed the entire game, not only for the church, although most especially for the church, but really for the whole world. I'm talking about the time when the ruler of the Roman Empire, Constantine, became a Christian. Now, like I had just said, the first 300 years of the church's life, pretty much from the time of Jesus up to the time of Constantine, Christians were very heavily persecuted. And they were persecuted for all kinds of reasons. Like we said before, a lot of Roman governors were nervous about the fact that Christians claimed that Jesus was the only Lord. And they felt that the level of devotion that Christians showed to Jesus as their Lord meant that they could never really be loyal Roman citizens. Christians also denied that all of the gods that most Roman citizens worshipped were actually gods at all. They claimed they were phonies. It was also a common rumor that Christians were cannibals because well, Christians claimed that they were eating the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ when they gathered to worship. Now, how bad the persecution got depended on who was actually the emperor at the time. Sometimes, frankly, it just kind of petered out for a while. Other times, it was really bad. Just for a couple of instances, under one Roman emperor, a favorite way of getting rid of Christians was to make them fight in coliseums against wild animals like lions or bears, and, you know, just not give the Christians any weapons to defend themselves with. Or another popular way was to dip Christians in oil and then hang them up on poles that lined the highways of the empire and light them on fire at night while they were still alive so that they could serve as street lamps and light the way. Sometimes the persecution got really well organized into full-scale attempts to just stamp out the church once and for all. In fact, the emperor who lived just before Constantine was a guy named Diocletian. And he was bent on wiping out the church forever. And so he instituted a policy where soldiers would go to the homes of every known Christian in the empire and would torture them to try to get them to name any other Christians who might be in the community and then to turn over any uh, Bibles that the churches had so that they could burn them in the streets and remove the scriptures from them. And then at the end of all of this torture, the soldiers would give them a choice. The Christian could worship an idol and burn incense to it. And if they did, well, then they'd get a certificate that would verify that they were, in fact, loyal citizens of Rome and they could live out their days in peace. Or if they refused to do that and continued to confess Jesus as Lord, they would be put to death. Clearly, it took guts to be a Christian. And what might surprise you is that the harder the authorities clamped down and tried to wipe out Christianity, the more the church seemed to grow. As Roman citizens watched these Christians die in these truly horrific ways and still confess Jesus up to their dying breath, sometimes even praying for the people who were killing them, well, that inspired so many citizens to find other Christians who would teach them just who this Jesus was that inspired that kind of loyalty and hope. And this happened so much that one of the early Christians, a guy named Tertullian, made this observation. The more you mow us down, the faster we grow. The blood of the martyrs is seed for the church. 
Martyr, by the way, um, is a word that means witness. Martyr became the word to describe Christians who were put to death for their faith in Christ. And as it turned out, the more that Christian blood was shed, the more the church grew. But let's just emphasize one last time, life as a Christian in those 300 years was hard and dangerous and took guts. If you became a Christian, you were serious about it as a matter of course, because it was just too risky to become a Christian unless you were committed. But all that changed with the Emperor Constantine and his conversion to Christianity. And this is how Constantine tells the story of how it happened. Uh, Constantine was at war with another guy, a guy named Maxentius, um, and they were fighting for the right to be the emperor. And it was October 27th in the year 312. Constantine and his army were gearing up to fight uh, the much larger army of Maxentius the next day. And so uh, the night before the battle, Constantine was praying to the Roman gods that they would help him win the battle. And instead, what he got was a vision appeared to him of the Cairo. And the Cairo is the traditional symbol of Jesus Christ. It's the first two letters in Greek of the word Christ. And as he saw this vision, he heard a voice from the heavens say to him in Greek, under this sign, you shall conquer. And when the vision passed, Constantine claimed he had never seen that symbol before that night, but he ordered all of his men to put that symbol onto their armor and shields before they went into battle. And the following day, Constantine's army completely overwhelmed Maxentius's much stronger forces, and ultimately Constantine conquered and became the Roman emperor. And when Constantine marched into the city of Rome to uh, make a victory lap, he summoned the bishop, or you might say the pastor of Rome, to meet with him. Now, up until that time, every single bishop of Rome had been martyred, that is, put to death for their faith, or died in exile. So you can imagine that when the bishop of Rome got this message, he was assuming that this was going to be the last day he would see. But instead, what happened is Constantine asked him, what can I do for your God? And the Bishop of Rome asked for two simple things. First, that Constantine would stop killing Christians. Second, that he would let churches have places where they could worship in public, what we might now today call church buildings. Well, Constantine did both of those things. On the one hand, he gave the churches throughout the empire a lot of old courthouses um, that they could use to worship in. But even more importantly, in the year 313, Constantine issued the Edict of Milan. And this Edict of Milan basically made it uh, the official policy that Christianity would be tolerated. The Edict of Milan formally ended persecution of Christians in Rome. Now, Constantine did a lot more to support the Christian church. He released Christian pastors and leaders who were in prison and brought them back from exile. Um, as the church continued to deal with uh, false teachers, he made it possible for pastors or bishops to come from all over the world to meet together so that they could hash out how to overcome the false teachings. And even though Constantine didn't quite live long enough to see it, because of all the ways that Constantine supported and promoted the church, just a few decades after Constantine's death, around the year 380, Christianity would become the official religion of the Roman Empire. So in just the span of a few decades, the church went from being one of the most hated and persecuted groups of people in the entire world to being the official religion of the largest empire in history. Now, quite obviously, almost every Christian across the world was overjoyed about the prospect of being able to actually worship God and follow Jesus without fear that they'd be punished for it. But that kind of change in fortunes came with a lot of its own difficulties that the church would end up wrestling with for the next 1,500 years. And that's what we're going to start looking at next time, the way that the church had to wrestle with its own success. And as we do, I want you to especially watch for this big theme that we're going to see come up over and over again. 
that throughout its history, the church has always wrestled with how to authentically hold on to its identity as the people of Christ. In fact, all of church history is basically one long story of how God continually calls the church to be the people of Jesus authentically and to bring more people to Jesus. And all the very difficult lessons that the church had to learn as it was drawn by God's call. And God has taught the church a lot about what it means to be Christ's people over the last 2,000 years. That's one very big reason that we're learning about all this, because the lessons that the church has learned over that time are our heritage too. Remembering what God has taught the church will go a very long way to helping you as the church today better live out your identity as Christ's people authentically. And that's all for now. We'll see you next time.